Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines. I speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On today's show, as fears of a global food crisis continue to spike due to the war in Ukraine, climate change and rising inflation, we speak with Dr. David Mezeroch, the CEO of Smartcast, an agricultural technology company who's building the largest smart farm in the Netherlands using AI, drones and robotics to ask about the real reasons for the food crisis, who will suffer most and why new technologies could be the solution. But can they come quickly enough? Dr. Mezaros, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, the world feels like it's at a tipping point. The UN has warned that global hunger levels are at a new record. Food prices are about 30% higher since Russia invaded Ukraine, and we've seen a significant drop in global food exports as well. Now, a few days ago, EU President Charles Michel accused Russia of using food supplies as a stealth missile against developing countries. He says they are solely responsible for the looming crisis. What do you think? Is Russia to blame or do the causes of the food crisis go deeper than just the war in Ukraine? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, absolutely not. So the Russian-Ukrainian war is uh, what's referred to as a catastrophic event or knee catastrophic event uh, when you're talking about the food system. But I would say it's a bit of a stretch to say that they are solely to blame. I mean, uh, we can all recall that we just had a supply chain crisis uh, the years prior, as well as an ongoing uh, pandemic. Uh, there are rumors of uh, another wave reaching uh, Europe and the MENA region soon. Um, and, and we can actually turn back the clock all the way to the 1960s. So the whole issue started uh, back then. Uh, just interesting fun fact, ever since then, the population has more than doubled. It's actually two, two and a half times the population uh, than it was uh, in 1960s. Uh, however, the use of fertilizers have increased by eight times. So that's an 800% increase. Um, but because of the diminishing, diminishing returns uh, of the effectiveness of these fertilizers uh, has dropped by about 95%. So I would rather say that this has been an ongoing, uh, long uh, expected problem that has been brewing and brewing and brewing. We never took it seriously. Uh, what I told you at the, at the previous chat that we had is that it's like running a business without having insurance. You just hope for the best that nothing goes awry, but then it did. And, and the frequency of these catastrophic events is just increasing. But certainly Russia still has a big part to play. You spoke there about fertilizers. Now, Russia is the world's largest exporter of fertilizers. And uh, Russia and Ukraine responsible for about 30 percent of global wheat supplies, about 70 percent of sunflower oil as well. Now, in your experience, I know you've consulted with governments all over the world when it comes to food security. How much do you think of global food supplies are under threat at the moment? Because one of the big issues is we're seeing not only current harvests affected, but also those for several years to come. They're under extreme stress. So uh, this has been a huge blow, uh, not only to the regional, but like you said yourself, to the global food supply as well. Uh, the problem is that we have increasingly relied on a uh, outdated, uh, very, very old, obsolete food system. This food system uh, positions itself on, on the fields, on the field farming. And because of that, there is a non-renewable aspect to it. There is a continuous new need for uh, fertilizers, whether that's uh, uh, phosphorus or nitrogen or potassium-based uh, uh, fertilizers. Uh, there is still a need for it. Um, and you cannot just expect the food system to switch in a matter of weeks or months. Uh, and that's why people are seeing this Russian-Ukrainian conflict, this war, as this massive trigger that finally made us realize that the current uh, unsustainable and, and non-renewable system just, just cannot continue. Uh, we're going to run out of food uh, within the next decade or so. So within the next decade ago, so you're saying we're going to see big challenges, big problems. How much do you think of the uh, world's global food supplies are currently in danger at the moment, driven by the supply chain disruptions we spoke about, the pandemic, but also because of the crisis in Ukraine? 
without serious change uh, to the to the food system itself, and as well as the value chain and, and the supply chain, uh, it is in a critical state. Now, the good thing is that we see uh, very, very positive reactions from, from European countries, from the US as well, um, and from China as well, depending on how you look at it. Do you look at it as positive from, from the Chinese population side or positive from a, from a global perspective? Uh, but, but the countries and the governments are reacting to this. I would say if there is no change, then in the next five to 10 years, we reach critical levels, almost irreversible uh, levels. Um, but uh, companies such as ours uh, have, have certain solutions for so-called controlled environment agriculture, whereby partially or fully we can mitigate the effects of these uh, catastrophic events. And of course, governments are dealing with it in different ways. We've seen countries like uh, India and Indonesia, they've come under a lot of flack in recent weeks. They've been criticized for banning the export of wheat and sunflower oil as well. Do you think they did the right thing in doing this? Because how do we convince governments that obviously securing their own food supplies needs to be essential, but how do we make sure that we're not enacting trade protectionism? Well, I, I tend to agree with those governments because their, their utmost priority should be about, you know, protecting their own uh, population and their own people. Um, it's, it's more in the way how they set up that structure in the uh, past few decades uh, that poses a threat. Uh, I am not in favor of uh, uh, trade protectionism. Uh, however, I am heavily against import and export because then that raises another issue with, with climate change and the emissions uh, related to that. Uh, what I would suggest as a solution is that each and every single becomes a food producer and relying their, their, on their own uh, food supplies especially when it comes to fruits and vegetables. But that's obviously a long-term solution as well. I'm interested to hear that you agree with countries like India and Indonesia who have restricted these food supplies, because as the saying goes, an eye for an eye and the whole world ends up blind. So securing your own sources has to be important, but how do we make sure that the world still has access to this essential food items if we don't have the necessary strategy in place yet? So there is a difference between policy forming and enacting that policy on a global level and producing your own food. What I'm advocating for is that every single country on the world should adopt a certain level of agricultural technology that enables them to produce their own food. Should another pandemic come around, another war or whatever catastrophic event, that they are not forced and reliant on another uh, uh, country and forced to trade with them. Um, um, you might remember what happened with the UAE when the pandemic has started. The UAE, very cleverly, has been stockpiling uh, food uh, and then, very funny, uh, a UAE that doesn't really produce a, a lot of food, actually imports more than 90% of its food, has, became, uh, has become a, an exporter uh, in the region to help. And that's very, very nice. We should help each other. We should collaborate between the countries. There should be cross-border trade. Uh, what I'm advocating for is that we should reduce uh, import export as much as possible by enabling those countries, by enabling the governments to produce fresh fruits and vegetables uh, on a massive scale that feeds their own population. But there's a difference between having, you know, uh, variety uh, and luxury uh, uh, goods uh, uh, or certain soft fruits that are consumed for passion and not for the caloric intake. Those could, should be imported, exported. Definitely, there should be global trade. I'm just saying that the basic caloric intake of every single country should be produced within that country. So it does seem like the world is overly reliant on a number of exporting uh, food countries as well. You're saying that diversification is essential. Are governments open to this change? Are they ready for that change? Absolutely. Actually, our entire business model uh, is, is, is centered around governments. So we're not a B2C or a B2B company. We're not going out there and marketing ourselves and saying like, hey, uh, buy what I'm selling. No, not at all. We actively, uh, proactively reach out to governments and ask, what are you struggling with? What are you importing at this moment? And then we make the conscious decision without fighting with the local smallholder farmers to produce those goods that they are importing at that given time. And because we can reach hundreds and hundreds of, uh, uh, you know, more uh, yield, more kilograms per target area than traditional farming, governments are responding to this very, very positively. Now you've consulted with governments worldwide in food security. You've led 43 projects in the EU previously. How do you think the risks of this disruption compare with previous food emergencies? And how do you think this crisis in Ukraine will change the food and agriculture industry longer term? 
So the, the problem with the, with the European Union is that they are very uh, much trend followers. They're not the trend setters. Uh, I am a European, so I speak against myself. But whatever happens in the US, in Russia, in some cases, China, uh, uh, sooner or later reaches Europe, and then we, we follow that trend. And Europe tends to have a very, very short memory. So whenever there is a catastrophic event, a few years later, they do as if nothing else happened. And they, they go back to those same fossilic, non-renewable uh, sources of energy, food, seeds, fertilizer, and so on and so forth. So I think what should happen is at the macro level, the highest level, so union level, commission, European commission level, uh, there should be new policies that are not only supporting, but also mandating uh, uh, new kind of technologies to be introduced to the oldest industry known to mankind, agriculture and, and, and food production. So it feels like too much talk, not enough action at the moment. Let's focus on this part of the world, for the Middle East as well. What does all of this mean for the MENA region? Because countries like Egypt and Tunisia, they import about 80% of their wheat from Russia and Ukraine and Lebanon. It's about 60%. And as we know, one of the big underlying reasons for the Arab Spring some years ago was food insecurity. So how much of a risk, how much of a concern is it uh, for this part of the world? So the entire MENA region is very, very close to my heart. I, I've, I've worked and lived there for many, many years. I still work with, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, very, very prophetic families, uh, especially in the GCC uh, countries. But we have received requests from Tunisia and Morocco uh, this year to, to go over there. So I would say that the technologies that we are using and, and, and companies like ours uh, uh, provide are uh, the best used in these countries. So the contrast is just huge. You know, when you introduce uh, vertical farming or automated robotic farming into the Netherlands, which is already, you know, a pioneer in agriculture, sure, you, you see increases, you see, see incremental increases, 20, 30, 40, 50%. But when you introduce it to a desert or near desert like uh, 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 region, uh, then you're looking at hundreds, if not thousands of, 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 of multipliers uh, compared to their traditional agriculture. So, so far, the, the reaction and the, the, the response has been overwhelming, very, very, very positive, and uh, uh, rightfully so. This is the kind of technology that can enable them to grow their own food without relying on either Europe or, or, or Asia, Southeast Asia for imports, uh, whether we're talking about seeds, fertilizers, pure food, or even labor. Okay, but again, long-term solutions. What about today? What are some of the potential risks or threats we could be looking at from the crisis between Ukraine and Russia? How is that affecting the MENA region today as it stands? If we're talking about today, if we're talking about the next few weeks, there's a huge impact for them. Obviously, their, their strong reliance on uh, imported wheat, imported rice, all kinds of grains, the fertilizers themselves on that what little land they have to propagate and, 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 and uh, farm on that, uh, it is completely disrupting their economy, especially the agroeconomy. And there is no other choice by the government than to use brute force, as in buy food at an increased price, to try to you know, satiate the, the demand for food uh, by the population. I would say that the it's not too late. Uh, we, we haven't reached that critical moment yet that we referred to earlier in, that comes in five to 10 years. If they make the conscious decision to switch now, as in this year, really now, then within the next six to 12 months, we could see the appearance of uh, smart farms powered by whatever natural uh, uh, resources they have, in this case, mostly solar, and then producing their own food. But yes, it's been a critical blow uh, that they suffered from this conflict. And we have seen some other options, some other avenues explored by governments in this part of the world, countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. They've been trying to secure their food supplies for some time. They've been investing in farms abroad, often in Africa. Likewise, we saw the US invest in farms in Mexico as well because it was much cheaper. Do you think this is a viable, sustainable solution or does it only work for those who are rich? It's, I wouldn't make the difference between rich or poor. I would say it's not a sustainable uh, solution because of the nature of humankind, uh, because of the current volatile geopolitical situation overall in the whole world, globally speaking. Um, I wouldn't advise a government to uh, uh, place uh, their food production in a foreign uh, land. I would strongly, strongly advise that they keep that, which is most precious, should be most precious, more precious than oil, than gold, than even data, 
uh, at hand within their own lands. Well, the FAO says the world needs to readjust its food portfolio. They say we've become too reliant on food sources like rice, maize and wheat. This is something you've mentioned as well. Now, these make up around half of our daily calorie intake. Now, there are ongoing concerns as well about the greenhouse gas emissions from the meat industry. So we know what we need to do, but is it realistic to expect countries to change what's on their tables so drastically? I think it's absolutely realistic. It's just that the communication needs to be uh, uh, done in a proper way. Uh, what I also told you uh, during our orientation discussion is that having two, three, four hundred pages long white papers drafted is no use for the population, is no use for the public. You're not going to readjust or make them rethink their dietary needs based on these long, um, boring, monotone uh, studies. You, would ha you have to go with the trends. You have to use social media. You have to use you know, movies, documentaries uh, uh, to essentially make them realize that uh, there are better ways uh, that do not go at the expense of your economic situation, you do not necessarily have to pay more, but there are conscious choices. This can be done both on a micro level and a macro level. You know, the micro level is more influencing, to, to use a, a trendy word from uh, our era, uh, the, the actual people to consume more fruits and vegetables and, and, and less meat. I am myself a meat eater, so I'm not a vegan or vegetarian, but it should be uh, uh, possible. However, from a macro level, there's Fun fact, uh, if you introduce just three to 5% seaweed into the diet of cattle, into cows, they reduce their methane emissions by 80, 85%. Um, there's been a study done on this in Australia, uh, published in the time a few years ago. And this can be and should be implemented by governments because it doesn't come with an extra, with an extra cost uh, component. Uh, it's just a win-win scenario. So we should look at these kind of solutions, whether it's the uh, production of fruits and vegetables, whether it's the more sustainable production and treatment of, of, of cattle, uh, or simply rethinking and readjusting our entire way of life. Uh, that's up to each individual government and each individual culture to define for themselves. But there are so many solutions to pick from that every single country should find their own. Okay, so who do you think is most guilty of writing these long, boring papers uh, that you mentioned before? I know you've criticized the FAO quite a bit previously for having these 500 long uh, white pages that we need to see more of an impact in everyday lives. So how do we go about trying to feed the population without destroying the climate? Because I know there's even big concerns about the poultry uh, industry as well that you've previously raised. Absolutely. So I, I would say that uh, just on the criticism part, I would say that it's not directly the FAO's fault. You know, they work based on a mandate uh, from the United Nations. I would say that uh, the, the whole system is, is broken in a sense that uh, people who are making the decisions, the rules, the directives for the population are... Uh, the tendencies that they, they happen to be older people, more senior people. So who's that? Um, who is to blame if it's not the FAO? Who are the people you're talking about making decisions? You're talking about governments or international bodies? Yes, I would say governments. I would definitely say governments, the international bodies, uh, international organizations, they try their best. They usually approach from an expert, from a pro professional perspective, whereas governments approach from a political perspective. So there's a difference between meaning well and using well research, you know, academically based data to improve uh, the situation, and there's a difference between what sounds nice, what is easy to sell. Okay, uh, so give me an example. Which governments are getting it right currently and which governments are, are getting it wrong? Um, I would say, so I just came back from Brazil. I met with the municipality level, the, the federal state level, and as well as the, the big federal level in the capital. Uh, I met with three ministers, the, the agriculture, the technology, and the, and the, uh, the economic development. Um, they, I think that they are getting it right. Maybe they didn't get it right in the past few decades, but right now, this year and, and going forward, they're definitely getting it right. Uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, they very much care about the rainforest, they very much care about their public image, but there's just a disconnect between what Europe, US and, and, and other regions of the, of the world think about them. So I think by combining technology uh, with a new way of uh, supply chain management, as well as uh, introducing a more rich uh, uh, diet uh, to the population, and doing this in a, in a kind of trendy influencer, direct social media communication way, that's the way to go. Because, you know, the younger the generations uh, 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 need to be addressed, 
the more you have to to sorry for the lack of better word but dumb it down make it easy make it snappy and short uh and and that's a good example i would say um, do you think, um, I guess, in, in some ways, it feels like the rapid transformation and digital push that we saw during the pandemic, do you think something like that is going to happen from the current food crisis? Is that going to have an influence on global food supply um, to perhaps introduce a more sustainable uh, way of sourcing our food? 100%. That's exactly what we do as well. Uh, we, we drive something uh, called a data-driven economy or data-driven uh, uh, agriculture, whereby you need to analyze every single uh, component, not just what the plants do or what happens inside, but also what happens ex uh, outside. You know, the agro-economy, the geopolitical conditions, prices, and not only prices of seeds and fertilizer, but also, you know, power prices, transport costs, etc., etc. I think in, in that, uh, the UAE is also a front runner because they are leading in in a way of digitalization digitalizing their their country and they are they're taking huge leaps okay so let's talk a little bit about your work because i know you're a big advocate of autonomous smart farms as well tell me a little bit about some of the work you've been doing you've been creating uh, the netherlands largest autonomous smart farm uh, over there at the moment tell me about exactly how that works so what we do is imagine it like this you have a, a, firm, a field, a farm field. You try to grow strawberries on it. Usually you have a yield of 10 to 50 metric tons on one hectare. One hectare is 10,000 square meters. On the same amount of land, when a, a 10 or 12 layer vertical farm is built by Smartcast, is my company, we can grow there above 2,000 metric tons. So approximately 200 times more high quality pesticide free and sustainably grown uh, uh, fresh strawberries. Not only that, but those are grown 24 seven. So from the 1st of January until 31st of uh, December, and they are grown right next to the city where they are sold. So just to repeat, 200 times more yield, uh, it's grown sustainably. So we're recirculating the water, we are using solar or wind or whatever energy is, is uh, uh, possible for us. And this is grown all pesticide free and uh, sold locally. So we are basically cutting out the middleman. There's no import, there's no export, and just you know amounts of uh, uh, by orders of magnitude uh, higher amounts. Right now, I'm based here. I'm uh, I'm here in the Amsterdam uh, location, but we also have a location in London. We have a uh, R&D facility in Hungary. And we're building a massive greenhouse in uh, Brazil. But I think one of the big concerns about smart farms is they're often criticized for only growing microgreens and food that just is not going to sustain the population. What about smart cars? Are you able to grow things currently like potatoes? Um, you know, some of those are more carb heavy staples. That's a very, very fair criticism. And I, and I am happy to stand in the line of those uh, uh, criticizers. But, but one should remember as well that this is an evolution. Is that a so yes or a no? What, what type of, what type of a ingredients? Yes, that's a, that's a straight so yes. So you we are can growing grow potatoes or what, what are you growing today? We are not growing potatoes, but there are other uh, vertical farms, indoor farms that are growing potatoes. So the technology exists, but there's a big but. Whether that's economically feasible and whether you're going to make profits out of that, that that's still a no. So what so are you rice, growing today then? Anything that grows in a greenhouse. So tomatoes, bell peppers, uh, aubergine, uh, beans even, uh, you can grow easily. Uh, obviously, the lettuce, microgreens, leafy greens, what you've alluded to, that's that's level one, that everybody can do that. But any type of uh, soft fruits, uh, raspberries, blueberries, uh, strawberries. Um, we also have research going on, active research on vanilla and uh, saffron. And we also uh, are looking into rice and soy next year. The rice and soy we actually want to deploy in Brazil to not only have an indirect protection of the rainforest, but a very, very direct. Uh, look at this. We can grow 200 times more soy or, you know, the research hasn't finished yet. So I don't know exactly how much more in this plot of land. So you don't have to cut down that many more, much, that's much more rainforest. Okay, but vanilla and saffron not going to feed those hungry populations in parts of Africa anytime soon. I know you are looking at creating a mega farm uh, for several countries across the GCC. How have you progressed in that? Which countries have signed up? What about investors? I know a couple of years ago, uh, you signed uh, an agreement with Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Nayyan. That was back in July 2020. Is he a part of this? Who is taking part so far? Um, He's not a part of this anymore. That was an early uh, uh, attempt at a, at a joint venture. It went, went pretty well, but then uh, uh, we had different uh, opinions about how to run this project. 
um, essentially, uh, we are discussing not only with uh, UAE uh, uh, government officials and, and, and sheikhs, royal families, but also in Qatar and in uh, Saudi Arabia, because what we believe in is that, especially for the GCC uh, countries, we could build one massive mega facility, as you have also kindly uh, uh, alluded to, and that one facility run completely sustainably, completely autonomously, using only renewable uh, uh, sources of, of energy and water, could feed these three countries. And we imagine it in a triangle format where one uh, equal piece of the triangle would be in one of the three countries. And by introducing uh, autonomous electric vehicles, uh, trucks essentially uh, uh, supplying then the largest cities of these three countries with fresh fruits and vegetables. So one mega farm, I mean, it sounds like something out of the movie. It sounds absolutely fascinating. What are the costs involved in, in, um, in creating something like this? And does having just one joined smart farm, does that not contradict a little bit about what you said earlier about being able to diversify and be able to produce your food, but get it from multiple sources? It doesn't contradict it because we're not talking about necessarily uh, little countries. When you look at, for example, the Benelux, where I come from, uh, you have the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg, but essentially they are such small countries that even considered you, you push them together, you still don't have the largest state of Germany, for example. So going back to the to the GCC countries, because they are so you know tightly wrapped around each other and, and, and they are already trading uh, with each other. Uh, it's essentially one block, one region that we could handle as one, same climate, uh, you can have then bilateral uh, treaties uh, around trade, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why we want to choose for one. There's another reason is because that population of the entire GCC is about 50, 52 million people on the entire peninsula, 80, 85 million people live. So there, there is no point in building three, five or 10 uh, smart farms, uh, whether small or big, because in essence, you're not supplying that many people and, uh, 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 you know, seeing the bigger scope of things. But I mean, and the UAE the and one... Qatar obviously had some political tensions years ago. It, it seems like it would make more sense to be able to diversify food a little bit rather than having just one central location. What if the power goes down? What if there's a problem? You know, we hear cyber attacks all over the world these days. If we've got one unit, surely that can come under threat. That's definitely a, 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 a good point. And that's why I said that we would have three legs of this farm and then it would be exactly based on the tribe border. And, you know, you would have one leg uh, reaching into uh, one country and the other leg into the other and then the third leg into the third country. The reason for being uh, all at the same point, because then we can pick the most ideal position from a climate perspective, from a power line perspective, from a water perspective and so on and so forth, plus Earlier, you asked the costs involved with this would be around a billion uh, dollars, uh, uh, 900 to, to 1.1 uh, billion uh, dollars. Uh, it would produce about 50, 50,000 uh, tons of fresh fruits and, and vegetables, which according to our studies would be uh, more than enough for the fresh fruit uh, and vegetable supply for these countries. And how do you do that? Do, how, what type of energy? Is it a desal plant or renewable energy? How are you being able to power uh, this huge uh, greenhouse? smart farm so uh most of the energy would have to be used as electrical uh, energy not as heat energy thermal energy uh because obviously we are in a, in a very very warm uh, part of the world um we would rely heavily on solar but uh even during the construction of a massive solar plant we could use uh fossilic fuels but very sustainably you know sustainable uh source of energy doesn't always mean that it needs to be re renewable immediately from the onset, uh, we can have a transition period. But that's the energy part. On the water, I would use solar. I, I would heavily use solar because sun is, is not in short supply in these countries, land is available and you can utilize it. And there are newer and newer technologies uh, in PV panels, some elevated, some transparent. We are also experimenting with uh, transparent PVs, which then allow for even more energy generation per target area. And then in the case of you know uh, sand, uh, uh, you have to clean it. We have technologies uh, that are automated robots, uh, strings, drones that uh, are cleaning these panels regularly without human intervention. So that's what we would do on the power side. And then you quickly asked about the water side. There are two, three solutions for this. Number one, because the systems themselves are hermetically closed, uh, anything uh, from uh, you know humidity to evaporation to direct irrigation, spillage, we can recycle. 
Now, of course, the recycling will not be perfect. We will have some uh, losses. Plus, also, you have the losses through the, the fruits and vegetables that leave you know, the greenhouses, the, 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 the units. Um, so we would introduce two uh, uh, water capture units. One would be a desalination plant, and the other one would be an atmospheric water generation uh, unit, which captures uh, the humidity from the air. And alongside the coastline, we have already checked, we've done uh, on-site studies on this, there's just enough humidity uh, in the air uh, to, to capture between four to 6,000 liters of uh, uh, water per unit per day. Okay, uh, just, which... um, just quickly, because we're all, almost out of time. Uh, when are we expecting this mega farm to be up and running? Have any investors signed on yet? We already have investors signed on. We are talking to, like I said, royal families from all three uh, countries, but we're also talking to uh, European investors and, and European public entities. Uh, we expect to finish the uh, early stage development, pre-engineering and designs in the next two years. And then afterwards we, we can talk about construction. So definitely not in the next two years, probably three, four years is when we can see uh, signs of this project. Okay, so no quick fixes. Uh, final question for you. If the world keeps carrying on as it is today, can the world really feed the global population of 10 billion people that's forecast by 2050 with our current food system? The world can feed 10 billion people, but not with the current food system. Okay, so what needs to be the top strategy? What needs to be the first steps to put this in place? The first is to cut the reliance on uh, fertilizers and uh, inefficient farming methods. Uh, we have assigned certain numbers to every single country, so not every country needs to have an autonomous you know, uh, AI run farm. Uh, you can start small. Uh, you can use drones to better divide the pesticides. Then you can use uh, certain foil technologies, polytunnel technologies, what Spain uses, Morocco uses to, to protect the crops. And then slowly every single country can transition. But in essence, using technology and innovative solutions is the key towards providing food security in the world. Oh, well, let's hope some of those changes come about quickly. Dr. Mezeros, thank you very much for your time and for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Thank you for having me.